prelude. Bob's going to come and read for us now. Good morning. Please turn with me to Psalm 106. Praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that keep judgment, and he that doth righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor that thou bearest unto thy people. O visit me with thy salvation, that I may see the good of thy chosen, that I may rejoice in the gladness of thy nation, that I may glory with thine inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies. But provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and he redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, and they sang his praise. They soon forget his works. They waited not for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. He gave them their request, but sent leanness into their souls. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered the company of Abiram. A fire was kindled in their company, the flame burned up the wicked. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Wondrous works in the hand land of Ham, terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach, to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. Yea, they despised the pleasant land, they believed not his word, but murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. They joined themselves also into baal Purim and ate the sacrifices of the dead. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. Then stood up Phineas, and he executed judgment, and so the plague was stayed. And that was counted unto him for righteousness unto all generations forevermore. They angered him also with the waters of strife, that it went ill with Moses for their sakes, because they provoked his spirit, so that he spake unadvisedly with his lips. They did not destroy the nations concerned whom the Lord commanded them, but were mingled among the heathen and learn their works. And they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils, and shed innocent blood, even the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed unto the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus were they defiled with their own works, and went a-whoring with their own inventions. Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against this people, insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. And he gave them unto the hand of the heathen, and they that hated them ruled over them. Their enemies also oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their hand. Many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel, and they were brought low in their iniquity. 
Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. And he remembered for them his covenant, and he repented according to the multitude of his mercies. He made them also to be pitied of all those that carried them captives. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the heathen, to give thanks unto thy holy name, and to triumph in thy praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise ye the Lord. We pray. Praise the Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to read the word, especially, oh, visit me within with thy salvation, dear Lord, that you would open our eyes to see Christ this morning. Dear Lord, our Savior, it is done, it is complete, and he is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Dear Lord, we worship you, our Lord Jesus Christ. By the history of redemption, all in one chapter. Beautiful reading. Thank the Lord. All right, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, let's sing this hymn to the tune of Bears of Fountain, Billable Bug. Oh, mystery. Returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Being forty days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil Taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And him only shall thou serve. 
And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, saying unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus turned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And there went out a fame of him throughout all the region around about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sights of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bearing him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, so also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, say a man of Syria. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him unto the brow of the hill, whereon the Arab city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way, and came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. In the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and heard him not. And they were all amazed, and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about. And he arose out of the synagogue, and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife and mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. Now when the sun was setting, all that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And the devils also came out of many, crying out, and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a, a desert place, and the people saw him, and came unto him, and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Pray. Father God, we come before you now and we praise you. Lord, we know that you are sovereign.
that you are named and purpose to all things. Let's be reminded every day that to put no confidence in this flesh because our heart is full of folly sin because we have a depraved heart. We ask you to forgive us. Father, we ask you to be with Brother Ken as he opens the word today. And Lord, we ask you to open our eyes and ears that we may see and hear the Lord speaking today to us to our brother Ken. Father, we ask you to be with each and every one of us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and look at hymn number 294, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. And we'll stand and sing this together. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy blessed pastures lead us. For our use thy foes prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, now as long as thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, now as far as thine we are. We are thine to come be friend of us, be the guardian of our way. Keep thy flock from sin, defend us, seek us when we go astray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Mercy to relieve us, grace to grant and far to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to thee. Bibles and look together in John chapter 5. The text is from verse 1 through 18. And if we don't get all the way through, then we we'll always come back to it. But I'd like to speak with you about the pool of Bethesda. This was a pool that was adjoined to the temple. The word Bethesda actually means mercy or flowing waters. And so there was some sort of tradition surrounding this particular pool. And I know that some sit and speculate as to whether what the people thought, because perception is everything was a reality or whether it was just their perception, but people gathered around this pool, impotent folk, blind, all, withered. And it says, waiting for the moving of the water. You know how people are today, even with the wind blowing, they see certain things taking place and they suddenly feel like, oh, that was the spirit going by. Or you've 
heard some when their relatives have passed on. They feel as if at certain times when the wind blows, the people say, I just felt that that was my loved one going by and reassuring me that everything was okay. And psychologically, they feel better. I'm not going to try to enter into all the intricate details of what was going on here because there's a message that is bigger than that. But let's read this in these initial verses here and draw from these what the Lord would give us. It says, we take this in parts, verses 1 through 4. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem find it interesting that whenever the scriptures speak of this as a feast of the Jews, we know the feast that the Lord required, the Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of the First Fruits, for which people were commanded to go down to Jerusalem. But there were also many other feasts that were added. And I find here that this was a feast of the Jews, whereby we don't know, nothing's expressed or told us specifically about it. Some say it might have been the feast of Passover. Others say, well, it may have been the feast of Pentecost. We're not told. All we see is that here in verse 1, our Lord Jesus went up at this time. And I believe as we read on, there was a purpose. It's just like Christ said he must pass through Samaria. If for no other reason, this wasn't our Lord giving credence to any feast of the Jews. We know that the feasts, as well as the temple, were given as a type of Christ, but they had all their activities going on. But as we read about this one man, there were many beside that pool that had this tradition, all the lame and the halt gathering there, that our Lord Jesus came for this one person, this one impotent man, who could find no help, even being surrounded by all the religious activity going on. It says here in verse 2, now there he is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. Let's go back and read, for example, and you can write this down, and look a little bit of the history of these porches that were built when that temple was rebuilt in Nehemiah's day. It had 10 gates, the walls that surrounded Jerusalem. And each of these gates was given a name. There was a sheep gate, there was a fish gate, there was an old gate, there was a valley gate, there was a dung gate, there was a fountain gate, there was a water gate, there was a horse gate. And these gates had specific significance as far as Christ is concerned. I believe this is where these were going wrong, where the Lord had named these particular gates for one purpose. Everything about that temple had to do with Christ. Some say, well, the sheep gate, that's where they brought in the sheep into the city. But as we read this, this sheep gate was the gate through which the sacrificial animals were to be brought into the temple. And every one of those animals that were brought were to be a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb. But here it was that the leaders of the day were making merchandise of these things that, that pointed to Christ. Just as I believe this pool became. We think of a pool because it, it means, Bethesda can mean mercy or it can mean flowing water. Either one pertains to Christ. This is a picture of Christ. Yet how many never saw Christ? It became a tradition. And they put their hope in the tradition and not in Christ. We could spend a lifetime and 
we do going through the scriptures, looking at all the meaningful types. But this sheep gate here, market, you notice, is an italic. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep a pool. This would have been a large pool where even the sheep drank and were given refreshment in their thirst, just as any that are Christ's sheep find that their refreshment in him. That's the picture here. So this pool was called the Pool of Bethesda near this gate. You can go and look it up, see pictures of it, some of the ruins of it. It's not there today, but you can see actually the layout of the temple that ultimately was destroyed in 70 AD. But you can act, they've done ar archaeological digs, which reassures us that everything we're reading here in Scripture has that historic basis to it. God's a God of history. And it had these porches that were built all the way back in Nehemiah's day, surrounding the temple. Now it says in, it says here having five porches. That's the, the ones we just talked about. But on these porches, verses 3 and 4, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk. Notice this was outside the temple. These would have been people that the Jews, the religious leaders of the day, saw as condemned. And that if there was any benefit they could get, it would be just through their alms that they gave. The religious leaders saw themselves to be above the people and pretty much tolerated any that were impotent or blind or halt, as it describes here in verse 3, having withered hands. And really having no hope when you think about it, because they were not admitted into the temple. You just assume that was the thought of the Pharisees. If they're born this way, then they're, they're, they're condemned. All they're going to do is live off of the alms of, of the self-righteous, the ones that thought themselves better than these. But they were waiting for the moving of the water. And this is the part here that Again, we can just state what the scripture says. That the thought was, whenever there's the moving of the water, and again, a wind could move the water. But either way, the Lord was purposing that these should be gathered around this pool, like so many today in religion. There's some, when you talk to them, they say, you know, I was deathly ill. And there was a moving of the water. I went to this meeting, or I went to this preacher, and they laid hands on me, and they prayed for me, and I'm old today. And so their thinking is that because they're whole physically, that somehow they're whole spiritually. They consider that that is their badge of honor, of glory. And they'll never leave that religion. I talked to one man where he was in such a religion and deathly ill and some preacher came and laid hands on him and he was healed. And the preacher told him, said, now if you ever leave our organization, if you ever leave our assembly, beware because then you face condemnation. And I remember preaching the gospel for him and he came up afterward in tears and said, I'm hearing a message that's new today that I've never heard before. It's away from works. But he said, I vowed, it's almost as if he had sold his soul to the devil. I can't leave this assembly, even though Christ wasn't being preached, because that preacher said, if I ever do that, I'll be a dead man. And as far as I know, he never left. That was the thing that was gripping him, holding him in, even though it was false religion. There are places like this. I remember years ago when I was up in Quebec, Canada, studying French. Someone spoke about this place we needed to visit. We took a day and went up there to see it. It's a monstrous cathedral, basilica, and it's dedicated to some supposed saint. 
But the thing about it where people come from around the world is because they have heard if they come to this place and stay there long enough, burn some candles, and bow the knee and wait, that it may be that this particular saint passed by like this wind and with the unction of the priest or anybody else there that they might be healed. And so people flock from around the world. And when you walk in and look around at just a majestic place, but nothing but idolatry, but there are the, the canes and the crutches of people that had come to visit that actually left them there because they walked out whole. And it's quite a thing to see. And you look at it and you think, well, is that the work of God or not? It is the work of God, but for condemnation. That's what Paul said. The day, even his day, would come when the Lord would send strong delusion that people might believe a lie. And you say, well, how can you say that it's for their condemnation? Because that's where their trust is. It's not in Christ. In fact, here was the Lord Jesus Christ that came this day to that place in that temple, and who gave him any consideration? Already his name was being propagated in this day. His name was being spoken of throughout the land. <clears throat> and yet when he came there, their attention wasn't on Christ, nor this man here. Because the only thing he could think of is, I've got to get to that water. It's like many people today think it's in an act that they do. Walking an aisle or saying a prayer or going into the waters of baptism. Somehow they're going to be healed. It says here, for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool. So... This wasn't something that was every day necessarily, but people still waited. And troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. That was their thinking. And there may have been cases where it was realized. People went away, testified, if anything, you've got to get to that pool of Bethesda. Never knowing that that water and all that pertained to that temple had to do with Christ. Anything else is temporal. Like people looking for the fountain of youth. If I can just get to that water, turn back the clock. You, know, you can go through these things and may even feel better. Even science today and doctors, when they do these tests about someone being treated with medicine versus just a placebo. Why do they call it a placebo? There's nothing in it. But people think that popping that pill, doctor, you know, calls them in the next week and asks them, well, how are you feeling, man, ever since you gave me that pill? I've been feeling better all week. Look, I can jump up and kick my heels. The doctor's saying, well, that was a placebo. How much the mind controls what we think and what we do. But he, no matter what, it's not looking to Christ. So that's all I can state here is that it was looking to the wrong thing, regardless of what men's testimonies were. And boy, it's a picture of works religion because it's first come, first serve. All of this defines how men perceive salvation. You better get to getting while you can get. And if someone gets there first, then there may not be anything for you. So what does that do for a lame man? Imagine him way back. There's a multitude here. And they're telling him he's got to get to that water. It all has to do with man and his decision and his will and his efforts and running, which is so contrary to the grace of God. Had he been left there, had the Lord passed him by, he would, he would have died there. Just like any one of us can attest to. It's not of him that runneth, nor of him that willeth, but of God that showed mercy. Here's that term again that I love in Scripture, a certain man. We don't even know his name. Just a certain man. It's like the thief on the cross. We don't know his name. He 
doesn't matter. The Lord will do it. And here a certain man was there, notice, which had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years of being unable to walk. Well, that's a picture of us in our depravity. Presume that this would have been from birth, we don't know, not told what it was. But we know that he was on a bed, which would be more like a mat. I've seen these sorts of things in Africa. They put down a mat, and that's your bed. And you move, pick it up, you, you roll it up, you carry it with you. And so he had all of this. He was surrounded by religion, but none to help. The picture here is that he was quite helpless. And yet he was not looking to Christ. This is how it is with any of us. If Christ doesn't give us eyes, if Christ does not come to us to seek us and draw us to him, we would never look to him. It says when Jesus saw him lie, that's an important statement. It's not him looking to Christ first, but when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Here's where preachers like to preach up man's supposed free will. You see, it's up to you. And so that's how it would. Would you like to be made whole right now? Would you like to be? Saved? Well, here's what you do. But at this point, he was not even, hadn't yet been given faith to even know how to ask of the Lord. As it says there in verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. I'd say that's a good thing. <laughs> because if the Lord's going to do a work of grace, there's not going to be any man to help you. We're not to trust in any work of the flesh or any man. He continues to declare the real issue that even if he were willing, there's no man to help. While I am coming, another steppeth down before me. So much for letting someone go in front of you. It's everybody for his own, each his own. And so even at this point, Though Christ knew him, because it says there in verse 6 that the master saw him. Here we see the sovereignty of God in seeking out and knowing ahead of time those that are his, to whom he has purposed to show mercy. We testify that if we're the Lord's today. It's not when I saw him, it's that he saw me. And Again, we see God's distinctive sovereignty here in that there were many other people there that were sick right along with this man, but our Lord Jesus Christ looked only upon him. And he knew him already, all about him, and everything he knew about him was nothing but impotence. That's, there's none of us that if the Lord has delivered us, we can claim anything good in ourselves. The Lord found us as we are. We're not told here that the Lord, this man saw the Lord or in any way knew him or in any way called to him. I actually heard a preacher say this one time, until you actually confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, then there's no salvation. The words actually have to come out of your mouth. And that's being preached all over. That's why these preachers say, well, let me give you the key. This is the hocus focus. If you repeat this prayer after me, then you can be sure of heaven as your own name. There's none of that here. Nor does the Lord require it as a condition of him. Well, if I'm going to deliver you, here's what you have to say or do. We're not told in any way that he even 
looked upon the Lord. Now, when the, when the Lord said, Wilt thou be made whole? This was not for any doubt in our Lord, but many times the questions asked to draw out of the sinner that cry. I believe that's the case here. It's clear that the Lord would have him be made whole, else he would not have set his affection upon him, would not have spoken to him. And that's why he was there. But this was to, the question was asked, it caused this man now, by the Lord's mercies, through the work of the Spirit, to draw his attention to the Lord Jesus Christ and away from that pool, away from everything that he had ever hoped into that moment. So that in the end, it would be clear that this was Christ's work to do this same. And again, the pool of Bethesda, the real meaning, sense of that pool was mercy. Here was the mercy seat speaking to him. We also translated flowing waters. He's the spring of living waters. But it was not to be in the physical water, but in the, the one that this water represented. Aren't these, what we're seeing here, three important things that the Lord uses to draw sinners to themselves? First of all, there's that great need. When the Lord is saying here, wilt thou be made whole? And he's brought to confess, sir, I have no man that's good. That means then that this is only something that the Lord himself can accomplish on behalf of the sinner. And secondly, not only the great need, but the hopeless state that he was in. 38 years. That's something to think about that. Unable to walk. And yet here was the one who in an instant, by his word, by his command, would make him whole. Such as the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's going to be Christ. It's not going to be, there's nothing here that this man afterward could testify and say, you know, as, as the wind went across there and I thought about getting up and running, all of a sudden here was the Savior. So it's a combination of what, what I do and what he does not. shows our helpless estate, our great need, but even more beautifully, the very power and presence of the one who does the same. Not just help you stand up, but actually saves. That's what his name means. Those who call his name Jesus, where he shall save his people from their sin. Today in profession, people want to know, how is it that you came to know the Lord? What was your experience? They want you to talk about all these things. And our only answer is like that in John 9, the blind man. All I know is I was blind, but now I see. People want to pinpoint something to an experience, and we need to be careful of that. When was the instant that you believed? At what point? It has nothing to do with that. It's just all I know, I was blind. I see. We did that. None other than the Lord Jesus. We're just like the simple man. Totally shut up to the Lord. That's what we see here. So he was really by the question there in verse 6, the Lord was drawing out of him this declaration. This is what it is to be lost. There's no help. There's no way back. He said there's no man when the water's troubled to put me into the pool. That's not where salvation is. It's not in the pool. People will, will come to a, a meeting. They'll come to a preacher. They'll come to an experience. They'll come to a baptismal pool. But they cannot come to Christ unless God is pleased to draw that sinner to him. That's what he does. Without any work of our own. So, 
former preacher who's passed on now, but he used to say that to people when they sat and listened to him. He said, without even bowing your head, or closing your eyes, or raising your hand, or moving a muscle, come to Christ. That's it. No man can unless the Spirit's gone. But I'll tell you, when the Spirit's gone, you don't need all that. You don't need man's testimony. Where you put your confidence in having raised that hand or bowed your head or prayed that prayer is some thing required condition for salvation. No. Christ alone. But when he says here in verse 7, there's no man to help me, that's a good thing. And the Lord is going to stop you. He says, But while I am coming, Another seventh down before me. Well, he wasn't coming to the source of salvation. He was coming, but it wasn't to Christ. Not till then. His eyes were still on men. And so, in verse 8, here again, the beauty of how God saves through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, without condition. He didn't get him aside and say, like, I would really like to save you, but I'm going to need your cooperation here. <laughs> Imagine Lazarus that was dead. And the Lord, when they rolled back the stone from the tomb, saying to him, Now, Lazarus, I'd really like to bring you back to life, but I'm going to need your help. Raise your hand. What can a dead man do? Cry out, Lazarus. What can a dead man do? Look to me, Lazarus. What can a dead man do? All we read here in verse 8 is that the Lord Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Here we see our sovereign Lord in whose hand is salvation. If he but speak the word. And that's where Christ said, My sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. That's all the word of salvation that's needed. You don't need to go and check this out then with your preacher or somebody else. If Christ but speak the word, that's what you'll do. According to his will and according to the fulfillment of his divine purpose, he said to this man. That's what's specific about salvation as it is in Christ. It's specific to those sinners that God has purpose should hear this voice. I dare say that there are others that have heard this gospel message being preached, but they still continue to gather around that water, that pool, that temple, that religion, their profession, with all kinds of other people around them, and yet they're Still where they are, where they ever were. They've never heard the voice of Christ. Here I see in this statement here, this is how the gospel is declared. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. First of all, the gospel is a command. It's not an invitation. People talk all the time about inviting the Lord Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior. No, this is a command very much. So is the, the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a command. The Lord told the Pharisees that. Tell us the work that we need to, to do that we might work the, the things of, of God. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a command. It's not a condition. I dare say that if any do believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God has already drawn them. We know that from Scripture. If you look over in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23. 1 John 3 and verse 23. Notice, this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us to me. I, I don't know a lot on the follow-up on this man, but I dare say that he didn't go back and rejoin that group around that pool. The Lord drew him out and gave him a fellowship with others 
who were the Lord's there in Jerusalem that he had not known heretofore because his eyes were in the wrong place. But with the command then comes the, the power of the word. You ask me, well, how is it, Ken, that you know the Lord Jesus Christ that he commanded it? And then gave the eyes to see him and the heart to look to him and believe on him. Well, that's, that's why I never go back. But secondly here, when he says, take up thy bed, this indicates then that he was no longer to remain in that place among the diseased and the dying. He would be changing his abode. Take up his bed. It's not a bed with posts like we're thinking of, but a mat. Just roll that, that old mat up and get on find in here anything with regard to what happened when he showed up with his man. You, you know there had to be some surprise somewhere. Honey, I'm home. Never going back. That's how we view religion. You ever drive by some of these places of worship? Your heart's not even drawn there. No matter if you look and see this part of my full of people just like these here around that pool. All seeking something. All hoping something. Everybody has a hope, it's just not a good hope. The only good hope is that true hope. But I dare say, if the Lord's delivered you out, you're never going back there. And those that are there will stay there until the Lord is pleased to draw them out. If he so pleases. So take up thy bed. There's, you're moving. No longer dwelling among the dead. No more than that demoniac of the gatherings ever went back into those caves. Until Christ spoke the word, people tried to tame him, chain him, restrain him, but he broke those every time until Christ came. And when he did, he came and bowed to the Lord Jesus Christ. When others had heard, they came, but where'd they find him? Demonic. He's no longer running up there in the hills and the tombs and the graves. The scripture says he was sitting at Christ's feet, that's number one, fully clothed. He was a naked man until then. Where did he get that cloth, that garment, other than Christ would have given it to him? Which is a picture of imputed righteousness in the name And having his right mind, it shows that people that are out of their minds are ones that still pursue salvation some other way than Christ. Those that have their right mind, and, and the world will say, we well, lost your mind. And you continue to talk to them of the mercy and grace of Christ. And it's according to his will. They're like, you have lost your mind. No, it's just the opposite. You've never had a right mind, thus you would not be speaking that. Wise, that was the command, take up your bed and the glorious word, walk. Not like some of these you see where they're a little feeble and someone's got to help them. And they're still calling it a healing. I read about a man one time that got all excited in one of his meetings and was jumping around and shouldn't have been. And ended up hurting himself worse than before and ended up in the hospital. Everything men command men to do, it's always going to end up worse than the beginning. Here it says it walk. Who can walk with those that have been, have been given the Spirit of God to walk? That's why the scriptures say walk in the light as he is in the light. But before any can walk, it takes the Lord Jesus Christ to make us whole. But that's how we walk. We walk in him. And we walk according to the strength of his power. And it's according to his command. It's not anything in us, for sure. It says there, I love that word, verse 9, don't you? And immediately. This is not something like you see on billboards. Try Jesus. You've tried everything else. But try Jesus. No, there's no try in Jesus immediately according to his command this shows that salvation is of the Lord where his salvation is given to sinners it is complete and it is instantaneous 
It's not a process, but instantaneous. Over in Colossians chapter 2, if you read there. Colossians chapter 2. Notice, coming back here, in verse 6, again, as ye have therefore what received Christ Jesus, where he's been pleased to deliver you and draw you to him, so walk ye in him. There's the walk. This is not talking about receiving him by your personal decision, but the word receive is to welcome him as he reveals himself in you. Walk ye in him. Rooted, verse 7, and built up in him, and established in the faith. There's only one faith. That's that which pertains to Christ and his death accomplished for sinners. As ye have been taught, not taught by man, but taught by his spirit. The Lord didn't need to take this man and say, now go get in a discipleship class so you can learn how to, how to walk. No. As you have been taught, all that was necessary as far as this man's being delivered, made whole, was in the command of Christ. And with it came the power. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. That certainly would have been this man's response to this, the rejoicing. And ultimately, why me, Lord? As I said, there were many others that the Lord did not even speak to, did not even address. It's like the thief on the cross. There were two of them, but he only addressed one of them. The other died in his sin. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There were a lot that were left of that vain deceit and that tradition still sitting around that pool waiting for the, the breeze to go, believing that somehow an angel was coming down and they'd be healed. I'm sure there was a stampede every time. And there wasn't a healing every time even if there was it never says there was it just says that was their tradition to run and i'm sure it's like preachers today that would tell people well you just didn't have the, enough faith you weren't zealous enough so he went back and sat down and waited but in him in christ well of all the fullness of the godhead bodily for ye are what complete in him which is the head of all principality and power we need nothing more, we want nothing more than Christ and his word of salvation. Christ wasn't just putting this lame man in a savable state. He's going to place you over here where salvation is possible, and now here's what you need to do to make it complete. Now, I love that word, as I said there. Immediately, the man was made whole took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. We're going to draw the line there because what follows here is so important. What was their gripe about Christ healing this man on the Sabbath? There again, men holding to traditions and customs and missing Christ. The Lord willing, we'll pick up with that the next time. Thank God for that salvation that's in Lord Jesus Christ alone. 474 in our hymn books. We'll sing this and be dismissed with stand. 474. Only a sinner saved by grace. This is our only confession to have for the Lord. Only a sinner.
Sings my story to God be the glory. I'm only a sinner, saved by grace. Once I was foolish and sinful, my heart causing my footsteps from God to depart. Jesus has found me.